a conversation with Dr. Michael R. Winston, historian and storyteller, part two. Dr. Winston, uh, welcome back. Thank you, it's good to be back. We will continue from where we left off last time. You told us about uh, President Mordecai Johnson's building program and I mentioned uh, architect uh, Albert Cassell. And uh, of course, uh, his legacy on the campus is well known. Uh, could you reflect on his uh, work at Howard University, please? Uh, well, Mr. Cassell uh, was remarkable in many ways. Uh, it wasn't simply his uh, gifts as a designer and as a team builder because uh, he was responsible really for the rebuilding of the campus from below ground up because there's an extensive tunneling system and so on uh, uh, that had to be developed before the buildings could be constructed. Uh, what was to be the new Howard University under the master plan after uh, the United States Congress amended the charter Section 8 of the Charter to provide for annual appropriations. Um, it's important to explain this. The university had received federal funds from the very beginning because uh, the Freedmen's Bureau had an education division that uh, supported elementary and higher education for the freed slaves. When the Bureau uh, was discontinued after the battle and reconstruction. Some institutions remained. Howard was one of them. Uh, but then it was completely on its own after there were no more bureau funds. <coughs> then in uh, the administration uh, that followed the founding uh, period, uh, William Weston Patton was the president. Uh, he was able to get a special $10,000 appropriation uh, to assist the university. This was 1879. And the university received an appropriation every year after that. The problem was there was no substantive law justifying that, so it only required a point of order to block the appropriation. And there was usually some senator from the South who objected, be saying that the university was a private institution and there was no justification for federal funds to be going to it by appropriation. And this went on. There was always a cliffhanger. Will Howard get its appropriation? And it meant that there was great instability about faculty and staff being paid and so forth. And during uh, the period when Representative Louis C. Crampton of Michigan was the chairman of the uh, House Appropriations Committee, he said this is preposterous that we do this every year and the university has no stability. After several years of effort, uh, the charter was amended in 1928 to provide for annual appropriations. <clears throat> and there had been created a joint committee of trustees, members of Congress, and some foundation people about how this new money would be spent. And so a, a master plan was created. And the master plan was uh, to, in effect, build a new Howard University. Uh, and that was done by 1930. Uh, the plan was clear and then the architectural work was done. Uh, there was a great deal of symbolism in what uh, Mr. Cassell and his chief designer, who was uh, Professor Louis Fry, F-R-Y, 
Uh, and they decided that uh, they would use colonial architecture, Georgia, the architecture that was extant uh, during the 18th century. Now, some people said that that is strange. Why is Howard University doing that? Well, the answer is, if you look at Founders Library, it is a copy of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, where the Constitution of the United States was adopted. So here in the middle of this campus, uh, where its law school was uh, fighting for civil rights, and there was this question about uh, the place of black people in the history of the United States. Everyone was to be reminded when they looked at Founders Library of Independence Hall. Now, there were some architects who opposed that. Uh, Hilliard Robinson, who was a colleague of Albert Cassell, uh, said to me once, well, well, that is plantation architecture of the slave masters. Well, that wasn't the point at all. But uh, Mr. Robinson was a modernist and believed in the international style. So everything he designed on the campus after Mr. Cassell was dismissed just had flat spaces. He, he designed the uh, College of Engineering and Architecture building and uh, the College of Fine Arts. Uh, Mr. Cassell plan did go through and uh, until the construction of Founders Library, uh, that was consistent. And uh, the Department of the Interior was responsible for the university at the time. And the Secretary of the Interior during the Roosevelt administration, Mr. Harold Ickes, was very enthusiastic about this. Uh, now, in point of fact, there was nothing strange about rebuilding campuses and adopting a style of architecture uh, that was quite different. Uh, Yale University had a colonial campus and in the 1920s adopted collegiate Gothic as its style. So all of the new buildings built in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s were in the Gothic style. Though, of course, in the period when Oxford was building such buildings, uh, there wasn't, there was nothing uh, native to the United States about it. Uh, many Catholic institutions adopted uh, collegiate Gothic, as it was called. The University of Chicago adopted it. But Howard adopted an American style to say, we belong here. And when you look at Founders Library and see uh, Independence Hall, you're supposed to think of the Constitution of the United States. And our role since colonial times, we had 5,000 black troops fight in the War, American War for Independence. We have been here. Uh, now, there were disagreements uh, with Mr. Cassell. Mr. Cassell uh, had his own ideas. He and President Johnson clashed over uh, the location of the president's office. Dr. Johnson's office had been on the second floor of the Carnegie Library. And so when the new library was going to be built, he thought the president's office ought to be in the new library. Mr. Cassell said that uh, a president's office didn't belong in the library. Well, there were many universities where the president's office was in the library. Uh, the president of Columbia University Nicholas Murray Butler had his office in the Lowe Library. Uh, so there wasn't anything unusual about it. But anyway, Mr. Cassell ignored that. And he had uh, some ideas about how all of that should be managed because when he became architect, 
Uh, he was also responsible for buildings and grounds and uh, he had a uniform system for keying and so on and so forth. Uh, he succeeded in uh, building the most iconic buildings at the university. Uh, the, the library, Douglas Hall, uh, the chemistry building, the power plant. There was originally to be four buildings like Douglas Hall connected by uh, covered uh, transit so that students in the rain or whatever could go from one building to the other. Uh, but there was this problem that the, build, the university's new plan uh, was for 5,000 students, and we had less than half of that. And um, so eventually there was the problem that the new facilities were larger than could be justified at that moment. And of course, that building plan ended when the United States entered World War II. And after the war, the university was terribly crowded because veterans were coming back and then uh, there was no longer the depression and so people who were not veterans were coming. So the university was overcrowded then uh, for a period of about 15, 20 years. So Mr. Cassell was a controversial figure while he was here. Uh, when he was dismissed from Howard, and he fought that in court, uh, and he won. Uh, uh, he became the architect for what was then Morgan State College, and it had a very different style of architecture, but he built a very fine physical plant for them. Uh, fortunately, the Moreland Spingarn Research Center has uh, many of the drawings and records of uh, uh, Mr. Cassell that were uh, given to us uh, by his son, uh, who was an architect. And the, his son had admired what we were doing at the research center because, frankly, I did not have any idea that his drawings and the plans for Howard University had been saved and were in the possession of the Cassell family. So uh, there are several large framed plans uh, and renderings of the, of the buildings that the university has. Uh, so I think uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the controversy surrounding Mr. Cassell has survived more than the appreciation of uh, the work. But uh, every one of his buildings uh, has survived uh, the test of time. Allow me to uh, turn your attention, Dr. Winston, to uh, the highlight of our discussion, the Moorland Spingarn Research Center. I have a few questions about um, Moreland Spingarn. Can you begin by telling us how the research center came about? What discussions were made and uh, how it was, uh, how the idea was conceived? Well, as you know, Mrs. Dorothy Burnett Porter had been in charge of uh, what at different times was called the Moreland Foundation uh, Dr. Jesse Moreland had given uh, his books and files uh, to the library uh, when it was still the Carnegie Library in 1914. And uh, there wasn't really an organized plan to develop that, but uh, good attention was paid to it because Dr. Moreland was a trustee and uh, he went frequently to the collection to inquire and so forth. And Mrs. Porter was appointed uh, as the librarian in charge in 1930. And that was very fortunate because uh, she not only was 
a Howard graduate and with, with long connections to the university, but uh, uh, she had, uh, she was a, a graduate of uh, the Columbia University School of Library Science and was trained initially as a cataloger. And uh, she then uh, was the person principally responsible for uh, the cataloging and organizing of the collection. And it was also very fortunate that she was uh, very well acquainted with research libraries uh, and special collections around the country. Uh, I got to know her because I met her and her husband, Professor James A. Porter, uh, at the reception for entering freshmen. I was 17 years old and terribly impressed with the two of them. Professor Porter was uh, a great art historian and uh, artist, and uh, she was uh, a petite and uh, impressive dynamo of a person. And I got acquainted with the collection. This is all happenstance. Uh, Mrs. Porter gave lectures uh, often and um, as part of the honors program of the College of Liberal Arts, uh, we were taken over to uh, what was the Moreland collection and she gave a lecture about the collection, what was in it, how it came about, and so on. And then she did something that she frequently did. Uh, she began a lament about uh, not having enough resources, and she didn't have any staff, and she usually said it that way, I don't have any staff, and so on and so forth. So I thought to myself, well, I should volunteer. So soon thereafter, I went to see her and said, uh, I understood that she didn't have enough paid staff. I, I didn't need to be paid uh, since I had a scholarship from the university. And if uh, she could use me as a volunteer, I'd be glad to do that. Well, it was a, a life-changing experience because she took me to back stacks and there was a empty Carol there, and she said, you can work here. And the first thing she had me work on uh, was some boxes and boxes and boxes of the unprocessed collection of Alain Leroy Locke. I was not handling manuscripts, uh, but all of Dr. Locke's library had been uh, moved to Moreland, including all of his uh, books, uh, journals, magazines, all sorts of ephemera. Well, here's this teenager going through boxes, and she gave me very precise instructions. If any of these articles are about the Negro, uh, you put this blue slip in the paper, in, 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 the, in the journal, or book, or article. Never touch it with pencil. We don't have any ink in here. And uh, we had, she had color-coded the paper slips so we would know what it was. Well, it turned out that was part of my education because it ended up that I majored in history and minored in philosophy. And he was a philosopher, a great one. And so I was seeing all of these philosophical journals and some of his publications and the whole world of uh, research libraries became clear to me. And I had no intention of ever becoming a librarian, a curator, or anything of the kind. That was just part of my education, and I wanted to help her. Uh, well, when Dr. Cheek became president, as I may have mentioned in our last discussion, uh, he requested of the Appropriations Committee a doubling of the budget. And in the first year, he was turned down flat. They did not give him one penny more than Dr. Nabert's highest budget. Second year, he 
came back with the same request. And in that year, it was approved. And so he had to then uh, commit that money under the appropriations rules. So at first, it was an expansion of the schools and colleges. We went from 10 schools and colleges to 17. Uh, and then uh, he wanted to do something about library resources. And his library requests were the largest in the District of Columbia. Uh, so Mrs. Porter was retiring in 1973 because he was not going to rush her or, you know, there, there were people who were grumbling and saying that she's been in charge over 40 years. And so he, he, she completed her time as being in charge and uh, was honored in multiple ways. And quite to my surprise, uh, I was in the history department meeting at the time with Dr. Lorraine Williams, going over uh, the manuscript for what became the history of the history department. And uh, there was a message that the president wanted to see me. And uh, so later that day, I went to see President Cheek and he said, uh, just, just to make clear, you are a, a professor in the history department. Yes, I was, yeah. I was by uh, 1973 an assistant professor of history in the history department. And uh, the, so I went to talk with him and he said, I ha every request I make of the Congress starts the same way. The first is for faculty salary increases because our faculty is greatly underpaid as shown by comparative data with other institutions that have medical schools and gra graduate programs and so forth. And the second is library resources. So the library budget uh, will be uh, every year quite substantial. And he said, I think we should do something about the Moreland Collection, and I want to have your ideas. Now, this was typical of Dr. Cheek. Then he leaned forward and said, I want you to give me a plan by early tomorrow, let us say 10 o'clock. And it should be a complete plan for what uh, should be done at Moreland. I, I did not uh, visibly gulp, I don't think. I just said, Mr. President, I'll be glad to be back tomorrow with a plan. I stayed up all night and had to think, what is it that we need to do? Well, we had an enormous amount of material, and uh, but it was essentially a passive collection. People would come and make requests, and then uh, Mrs. Porter herself would get materials. Um, if she was out of town, you were out of luck. All right, mm. so. I then proposed a Moreland Spingarn Research Center. Spingarn because it had the, it included the rarest books in the collection. And Mr. Spingarn had, it is true, as the phrasing went at the time, allowed the university to acquire his collection because many institutions were after it. Uh, Unlike the Moreland Collection, which was a general collection, um, Mr. Spingarn collected works by Negro authors only, whether they were African authors, Caribbean authors, or Black American authors, and going as far back as possible, uh, including 
works by Juan Latino, the great uh, Afro-Spanish uh, humanist, uh, and many of the works that were very, very rare. What many people did not know was that he had provided in his will that what the university had paid him for the collection, he would give back, and he did give it back. So we, in effect, got it for free. But his reasoning was, if they have to pay for it, they'll take care of it, which turned out to mm -hmm. be true. So um, now, what I thought was we need to be an active research center, generating research, responding to trends in research fields, because, for example, uh, what historians were looking for had changed. Uh, the writing of history had been influenced uh, by the great man theory, and, uh, and that's what it was, the great man theory, not great person theory, uh, of history. And so you collect material about great individuals, and then that will, that will be history. And so institutions collected material that for biographies and so on. I was interested in social history, and I had read a good deal of sociology as well. And I knew that the most recent history was going to be institutional. Uh, it was going to be from the bottom up, not history from the top down. And so we would need to actively collect records of organizations and institutions. And this was particularly true uh, in the case of black history because the tradition had been to write about white attitudes toward black people, what white people were doing to or for black people. In the 1960s, there was the turn, what was the history made by black people? And that means black organizations, individuals, institutions, communities. Uh, we were aware, of course, of all kinds of organizations that were active in civil rights and so on, but the institutional documentation was poor. Uh, E. Franklin Frazier, the great sociologist, said that uh, Negroes had developed two great institutions that were drivers of black progress. And that was the Negro church, going back to the 18th century, and the Negro school. And then beyond that, communities and institutions. Uh, so, that would, Wallen would then need to not just be a repository for books, but a repository for manuscripts and original records that no one else had uh, to document what black people were thinking about and doing and seeing their interpretation of their circumstances and history that they had made, therefore you had to go to them. So I proposed in that document that uh, there be uh, a library division for the traditional collection of books that we had, uh, a manuscript division that would be responsible for uh, collecting and curating and making available manuscript materials. I then, and that manuscript division would include a manuscripts department, a prints and photographs department, since photography had transformed our understanding of the visual uh, surroundings that people operated in. What, what did the environment that history took place in? What did that look like? And music, because um, 
Mr. Spingarn had collected uh, sheet music and much of it was very important and was fragile and so it would be, be music. And then an oral history department because oral history was just emerging as a distinct field within the historical profession. And we had no organized program for interviewing people and doing transcripts. And fortunately, uh, Dr. Ralph J. Bunch, who had been head of the political science department at Howard and uh, was winner of the Nobel Prize in, for Peace, uh, he had proposed to a uh, foundation that uh, there be something called the Civil Rights Documentation Project. You can see all of these civil rights leaders and people who are active are dying out and we need to have them interviewed systematically and these, this material made available. Well, the Civil Rights Documentation Project came to an end and then was given to Howard, but it hadn't been processed. It turned out they had, with no legal releases on it, the material was not usable because uh, there never had been uh, uh, the proper legal review so that the rights and the research availability was Howard's and not those individuals. So that was going to be the core of the oral history department and we had an oral history librarian. And then there was also proposed a research department, which we had at the beginning, uh, and because I thought we should uh, have some research that was generated by the research center. Um, and the early members of the research department were some PhD students uh, at Howard. And I also thought that the Moreland Spingarn Research Center should have a journal because we have all this material. And uh, so it was a very optimistic plan. And uh, it was, that was all laid out. And then I said there should be a university archives because uh, the university is making history all the time. And it's not just the records of the Board of Trustees, but there are offices that build records over time, but they're under no systematic administration at all. And in some cases, when employees left, they took the office files with them. In some cases, they were just thrown out. Uh, they had collections of photographs and so on. And so uh, university archives would be the responsible party. And uh, we would hire an archivist, of course, and a staff. And a part of that was to be records management because typically in universities, records just get thrown out when the files get full because new people come in, new staff come in, and they need space and filing cabinets. And if the, fi the files are 40, 50 years old, they're no longer in active use. So it would be university archives. And then, from time to time, Mrs. Porter had collected uh, artifacts from around the world. And I said, most major universities have a museum, and Howard should have one too. That's my alumnus hat. So uh, I proposed a university museum. We have a university art gallery in the College of Fine Arts, and the university museum could be uh, a part of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center, and when its collections and reputation had developed, it could be split off. So uh, I didn't know what the president was going to do with this. I thought it was very ambitious. Uh, Mrs. Porter's highest budget was $80,000, and what I had proposed was well over a million. 
And I'll never forget this moment. Dr. Cheek looked at me. He went through it very, very carefully. Uh, he was a chain smoker. And I just sat there while he smoked his way through this document. And he looked at me, looked at the number. He said, is this all you want? <laughs> I thought he was going to cut it in half, uh, give me a fourth of it. And he took out his pen. He had a, he had a huge set of initials, or his signature was always very big. And he just signed, said, just give this to the treasurer. Well, I left his office uh, in a very contradictory state. I was elated that uh, uh, this had been approved. I also felt like the weight of the world was on me. Uh, and we had an agreement uh, that turned out to be difficult. I said, uh, Mr. President, uh, I came to the university uh, to teach history. I'm very happy to be a faculty member. And that's what I want to do. I think this can be started uh, over a two-year period. And then I would like to return to the Department of History so that I can carry that out and uh, but there will be many people who will want to have uh, the position of director of the research center. Oh he agreed, he agreed. So uh, I uh, went about implementing the plan and uh, the first difficulty of course was that the Moreland Collection had been a collection under the administration of the library. And so uh, the university librarian was ultimately in charge. And that had always posed the problem for Mrs. Porter because uh, the university librarians generally didn't know about special collections and so on. And uh, the person who was in charge at the time uh, had a degree in Romance languages, but didn't have any background in libraries particularly. So th they were always at odds. So it was agreed that the Moreland Spingarn Research Center would become independent of the university library administration and would report, the director would report directly to the vice president for academic affairs so that there wouldn't be uh, that difficulty. Uh, the news of the establishment of the research center was not well received by the university library staff because uh, though they did not work in Moreland, they were very proud of the fact that this was in their, in their building and so on. And uh, the, the Howard University Library Association, HULA, uh, expressed its opposition. Uh, and then there were other librarians who expressed their opposition to the appointment of a historian rather than a librarian. I did not have a degree in library science. Uh, most directors of research centers don't have that, by the way. Uh, so um, there were those difficulties. Uh, but getting, building a staff, and fortunately, this was very fortunate. At the same time that Dr. Cheek provided a very substantial budget, uh, there was a project to renovate Founders Library building at the same time. Uh, and an architect, Robert Lionel Fields, was given the responsibility for that. And so the president told me I needed to meet with Mr. Fields and tell him what our requirements would be. And uh, I asked the president to provide Moreland Spingarn with the ground floor of Founders Library for the manuscript division and the various departments. Those rooms had been used 
as law school seminar rooms uh, in the 1930s. During that period, I visited a number of research libraries, uh, and one of them that was very handily near was the uh, Folger Shakespeare Library downtown. And uh, I went down to meet with Dr. O.B. Hardison, who was the director, and to see what kinds of facilities they had. I had not been in, though I had been in the Beinecke Library at Yale and the Houghton Library at Harvard, I had never been in the Folger Shakespeare Library. And I saw what they had in the way of conservation uh, facilities and photo reproduction and photography and what they were doing about conserving their collections. So, uh, we, as part of the plan, we set up a photo duplication department and uh, that was a microfilming operation because the Black Press Archives project had black newspapers coming into Moreland every week from all over the United States. And so we started microfilming those systematically. Uh, Mr. Alex Rayfield, who had done that in the military, uh, was hired and uh, was excellent, and he had a good staff. And the photography department, uh, one of the best photography studios and photographers in, in the country uh, was the Skirlock Studios uh, at 9th and U. So I went there and uh, persuaded Mr. William J. Scott to come to Howard, which he was very happy to do. And he became a staff photographer and in charge of uh, the photography department so that because Mrs. Porter had to send things out to be photographed for researchers to use. And that's hazardous because you've got fragile material, old photographs, uh, daguerreotypes, and so on, and they really should not leave the building. So it, we created a one-stop service where the researcher is working in a collection of papers or they find a document that they need reproduced, we could do it the same day. Hmm. And when they, because some people could only spend a day or two and we could provide that to them immediately. So uh, uh, Mr. Scott got the best equipment. It was one of, we had what I regarded as uh, historically speaking, the Japanese advantage. Uh, the British, as you know, were pioneers in industrialization. When the Japanese got into industrialization, they were able to begin where the British had left off. And we could begin with new equipment and newly trained staff where the other institutions had left off. We could pick up. Uh, the key to the success of the research center was not its design uh, and not even the ideas behind it, but the staff. One of the things I had observed was that uh, Mrs. Porter had a very old fashioned system where when she came in in the day, uh, she did what she called, she started staff. She visited the staff. She didn't have a very big staff, but they were not to do anything until she got them started for the day. And I wanted a staff system where the staff knew what they were doing. I did not need to tell them what to do. I did not need to supervise them. That's why they were in departments. Uh, and all of them <coughs> had gotten professional experience, and in many cases, advanced degrees <coughs> after they were employed at Moreland. Uh, because it was my view that uh, if they're working with many of the leading scholars of the world, they ought to know exactly who those people are and what they're working on and why, and be able to help them directly. You know, not just a matter of uh, 
putting something in front, going to the shelf, and that to me is not research librarianship. That's that's just transportation from the shelves mm -hmm. to uh, a table. Uh, so I wanted the staff to be able to have initiative. And you had a large staff, right? And the, yes. the number of the employees at Moorland was big. Well, but, yeah. and what again doesn't get highlighted enough, a substantial percentage of the staff were students. Now, students had worked in Moreland, but uh, uh, they were just student workers as far as most people were concerned. I said, all of that is just wrong-headed. Uh, students have some of the brightest minds on the campus, and I'm including faculty. Students can be trained, and students can have great morale if you treat them properly. So a part of that was the image of the staff person at Moreland. So you will notice in the photographs that everyone on the staff was identifiable by a blue coat with their name on, the, uh, on that. Uh, and people called them by their name properly. Uh, it changes the atmosphere. If somebody is bringing out a rare document, if they look like they are curating something as opposed to just hauling something off the shelf. And they were proud as they could be to have uh, some official identifier. It also was very good for security because you've got all these people moving around. If they had a blue coat on, they were staff. If they didn't have a blue coat on, they weren't staff. Uh, and every, I, I wore a blue coat over my suit. And uh, the uh, chief of the manuscript division did that, and the chief of the chief librarian. Everyone, including the secretaries, uh, were in that attire. And uh, we had training sessions for the students. And so they were staff. And when those students graduated, we had a ceremony for all of them. They were very proud to be staff members at Moreland Spingo. And the staff morale soared. Uh, we had annual events just for the staff uh, because they worked very hard. And uh, everyone was impressed when they saw Moreland Spingarn staff. There was a, just a different field. Nobody, no, no other employees in the Founders Library had anything like that. And uh, they were happy to work hard, and they did. Uh, but they, they were recognized for it. And, um, that became, you know, a number of those student workers eventually became professional librarians. They got interested uh, because they were working there and they could see what was going on. Uh, but the quality of the center was not just about what was available there in terms of research materials. It was the, the spirit and the staff work and uh, the cooperation that we were able to get with the whole university. When I left Dr. Cheek's office floating on air because I had just gotten this budget, I walked directly from the administration building to Lock Hall to speak with Mrs. Millie P. Baker, who was going to be, I hoped, my administrative assistant. I had worked with her. I never mentioned this to her, that this Moreland thing was coming up. But when I was assistant dean of the college, I had worked with her and saw how hard she worked and uh, how effective she was in working with other officers. I said, we will need something like that at Moreland. So she, she accepted my offer to become my uh, uh, administrative assistant. And we worked together for 17 years, 10 years in Moreland and seven in the vice president's office. And just as I had hoped, 
she had worked at Howard since she graduated from high school and she had superb skills, but she knew staff in every office on the campus. And so if we needed a requisition cleared, a purchase order expedited, she knew the person to call in that office and so on. And some other operations thought there was something mysterious going on at Moreland. How do, how do they get so much done and people just do things for them. What's going on? What was going on was mutual respect and appreciating people, uh, including the janitorial staff. I knew every janitor's name. I told them what we were doing, why this was special space when we had uh, special public programs. I would let them know uh, we're, we're having the, the vice president of the United States will be here, head of state will be here. We had many such events. Uh, as organization, the Shriners will be here, whatever. And we would invite them to come to the event. It would be, in many cases, it would be their day off, and they would come in their Sunday best, and, observe, and they were part of the enterprise. Uh, it was without a doubt, outside of teaching, the best experience I had at Howard University. Those 10 years uh, were an exercise in institution building. And then, of course, uh, as the university's uh, fortunes shifted up and down and up and down, the research center's resources went up and down as budgets were cut because our great period of prosperity was when Dr. Cheek doubled the budget. And then uh, what the Congress had not anticipated was that that was not going to be a one-stop situation. He had other plans for more PhD programs, more institutes and centers, more campuses, uh, building out the professional schools, more equipment requirements, and so forth. And so there was pushback. And as the university's budget was squeezed, because there were many people by that time in Congress who suddenly realized that that was not talk. Dr. Cheek's objective was to put Howard University in the top rank of American universities. Now that was a different kind of objective. There were many people at Howard University that were pleased as they could be that Howard, in their view, was the leading HBCU. He said, that's nonsense. Those places, for the most part, are colleges. This is a university. And we have been around for more than 100 years. We are older than many institutions. And you know, I looked into that because I had many discussions with him. You know, how is older than Stanford? It was a university longer than Columbia University. Columbia College, called King's College originally, had been around since the 18th century. But it did not become a university until 1896. The University of Chicago was founded after Howard University. And his point was, these other institutions are being resourced in a way that enabled them to get better and better. And Howard was kept starved of resources so that no matter how gifted our faculty, how gifted our students, we're always being held back by a lack of resources. 
And so the pushback was real because the other universities in the city had a reaction. How is it that Howard's library resources are so extensive? The other hospitals said, Howard University had a 500 bed hospital, had the newest equipment, the newest surgery suites, a whole array of new uh, training programs, not just in uh, specialized areas of surgery, but ophthalmology and so on. There was a sickle cell center starting. Dr. Cheek started centers like some people get pets. They were just, they, they were all over the place. And so when the constraints began, uh, Moreland's budget was affected because, uh, which is usual for universities, as uh, position, as people left positions, they tended to get frozen, so-called, and then they tended to disappear. So there was a gradual erosion of positions and resources to acquire books and other materials. We never paid for collections. I never bought collections because I thought once you do that, and not just a question of fairness, people are going to insist, well, I, you know, it was announced in the paper, you, you, you paid $50,000 for that collection, why are you not paying me for mine, and so on. So uh, my argument to potential donors was the university has invested in this very expensive renovation of the building. The renovation costs more than the original building. And uh, so, the resources to preserve the material that's been provided by the university. The security system, we had electronic surveillance everywhere, uh, first on the campus to have as much security as we had. And uh, because there was some talk about insurance, and I said to Dr. Cheek that uh, it doesn't make sense to me to insure these items because you can't replace them, they're unique. So we need to put, make the investment in security. And uh, it's the same thing with not just theft, because research libraries are always subject to major theft. There was a, in, in the 1980s and 90s, there were professional thieves out uh, stealing uh, first folios of Shakespeare all over the world. Any library that had a Shakespeare first folio, uh, there would be an attempt. Some were successful, and usually they could be recovered because every one of them was known through extensive cataloging. Uh, but there was the problem, what do we do about fire? Well, ordinarily, you have a sprinkler system. But if there was a fire in Founders Library and the sprinkler system was triggered, then our collections would get soaked. So I had the District of Columbia Fire Department chiefs, one after another, every responding district that would respond to a fire at Founders Library came to Moreland's Bingo, and we gave them a tour. And because we had all of those locked cages. We had, and so in a fire, you have to have a provision for, since we were not gonna have a sprinkler system, I had recommended that uh, a gas system be installed, but that was never done. You, you can protect a collection by gas that is released instead of water, and it smothers the flames, but, given the age of the Founders Library building, uh, that really wasn't feasible and the days of money had passed. So uh, that did not happen. But what the center became was uh, a globally significant uh, research center. And uh, we kept a log of all of our visitors, 
every one of the annual reports indicated the number, where people were from, and in most cases, what they were working on. And uh, our publicity efforts uh, paid off in that regard because each time we acquired a major collection, I had a pub public program to show it off, and we usually got good press coverage because I became acquainted with uh, all the newspaper editors and uh, the local TV stations. And so we did black press events and others. They were there. And I cultivated the people at Jet Magazine. So usually when uh, we had a program, Jet Magazine was there with a photographer and a reporter. Uh, so we became very well known in the black community, not just by scholars, because I, nearly everywhere I went in the country, someone inevitably would say, aren't you Dr. Winston from Howard University? Uh, when we began the Institutional Ar Archives Program, there are thousands and thousands of Shriners and Masons, and then the sororities and fraternities and so on, and people knew about the research center. Uh, so it was it, it was a very demanding situation. I worked very hard, as did all of the staff. Uh, and uh, the reward was in uh, the quality of the program. We had we had some lectures in connection with particular collections acquired. We did not have a freestanding uh, lecture series. They're, they're photographs of people giving lectures mm. and uh, of, uh, and that, that was again part of this idea of a, a, a proactive uh, operation. Uh, we started uh, collecting uh, the papers of leaders in higher education, for example. So uh, the papers of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, who was <coughs> the distinguished president of Morehouse College. Uh, his papers are at Mormon Spingon. And Dr. John Warren Davis, who was uh, for 36 years president of West Virginia State College and uh, one of the great leaders in American education when Harvard awarded Dr. Davis an honorary doctorate. He was called the Dean of American College Presidents. Uh, and as it happened, uh, he was Dr. Mordecai Johnson's roommate at Atlanta ba Baptist College. And uh, he was of enormous help to me personally and to the center institutionally because uh, he liked my ideas about organizations. And so he said, uh, well, I will put you in touch with the Shriners. And, uh, he said, you may not be familiar with them, but uh, they are remarkable. And uh, they will be eager to help you once they know what you're doing. Well, as it happened, uh, the Shriners, whose formal name is the Ancient Egyptian Arabic Order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, became the largest cash donors to the Moreland Spingarn Research Center because every year they came to make a presentation of a check uh, to support our work. And um, we were given their records and that became a, a, an extraordinary network of support. Now, Dr. Davis had done the same thing at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York because of go to their offices, there's a bronze plaque uh, thanking the Shriners for their annual support. And that, Dr. Davis engineered that. Um, and then we did the same thing with some of the Prince Hall Masons. And that became important because the Masons and the Shriners are pillars of the black community, wherever they are. Uh, they are not scholars, they are not academics, 
but in many cases, they make the black community work. Uh, we had a very active community program. So one group that we had working with us, and we were working with them, was called the We Angels. And uh, this group was rescuing black cemeteries. I had never heard of them before. And they came, they, they saw something on television about New Orleans being gone, and I was talking about it. And uh, they came and pointed out to me that real estate developers, including those associated with the metro system, uh, were buying and moving historic black cemeteries in the District of Columbia. And, um, and there were some very important ones like Harmony Cemetery. And so we helped publicize that. And they became part of our network of community organizations that uh, uh, provided all sorts of information about people, places. They had collections of things. And uh, so uh, that was another dimension of making the Moreland Spingarn Research Center a part of the community. Because many people on campus were talking about the black community, but weren't involved with the black community. Uh, they were typical academics in the, their own world. And um, I believed that uh, to maintain our tradition, it was a very important to be as inclusive as possible. Um, though I don't strike many people as the inclusive type, but uh, I don't think one has to be snooty to be uh, an academic. And I learned a great deal about uh, the Washington, D.C. community as a, as a result of those, of those efforts. Um, so it's, Moreland is many, many things to many people, but I think that it's uh, one of the great assets of the university, and it is a part of the uh, research enterprise nationally in the United States. What are the most memorable events and visitors that uh, you can tell us about when, when you were di the director of Moreland Spingar? Uh, well, uh, one was <coughs> President Leopold Sedar Senghor, president of Senegal, and uh, we were able to make that connection because when President Senghor was in Paris in the 1930s, he was a very close friend of Professor Mercer Cook of the Howard University Romance Languages Department. He was head of that department. And uh, we also had on the campus at the time, the head of the African Studies program was Leon Gontran Damas. Uh, and he was a very good friend of Pres President Senghor. And so President Senghor visited and we had uh, produced a bibliography uh, to recognize his contributions. Um, there, it's hard to single out any one group. You think of a head of state, of course, but uh, uh, the roster of scholars was extraordinary. It was just hard to think of any major figure in the writing of black history who was not a regular uh, visitor and user of 
Moreland Spingarn. Uh, uh, Dr. John Hope Franklin, of course, had been a faculty member in the history department uh, from 1947 to 1956 and was still coming regularly, and he and I were good, good friends eventually. And uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin Quarles, who was at Morgan, came regularly uh, and was very helpful in many ways in, in making connections. Uh, and Dr. Charles Wesley, who had been uh, head of the history department from the time it was organized as a department. He went, became a member of the faculty in 1912, but uh, Dr. Wesley was remarkable in every respect. Uh, he had not only been head of the history department, he was uh, dean of the graduate school at Howard and uh, was a very effective dean. And then he, uh, became president of Wilberforce and later uh, Central State University in Ohio and uh, was a regular user of the collection. And at one point he became uh, head of the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History uh, and has, as you know, had been uh, very closely associated with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who had also been a member of the faculty and had also been dean of the graduate school. Uh, and that was another set of connections. Um, we were very close to the Journal of Negro History staff. Uh, at one point, uh, it was proposed that the journal move to Howard, and there was some opposition within the organization to that. They thought that Howard might swallow it up. And so uh, it ended up not being part of any university. But uh, at one point when the association uh, did not have the membership that it once had and they were short of funds, it was thought that uh, Howard could be a sponsor of it since the Journal of Negro Education was published at Howard and was very successful from the time it was started in 1932. So um, that was a, another kind of connection. And um, there, there are some church records that are at Moreland and family collections have turned out to be very important as, as researchers are looking for diaries and, uh, and photographs and uh, other kinds of, some people call them ephemera, but uh, in many cases I don't think you can understand the situation until you have read some diaries and you have uh, seen the results of a major general trend reflected in a particular life or a particular family. And um, uh, some of those family collections throw a great deal of light on, on uh, the history of the city and the history of the country. Let me turn your attention to uh, the three successive uh, presidents of Howard University, Mordecai Johnson, James Nabrit, and uh, James Chick, uh, I know you told us a little bit about each of them. What, in your view, is each of the president's legacy? Uh, and what, what, in your opinion, uh, were some of the defining moments of each presidency? Well, it's interesting because while he was living and then afterward, the most frequently made statement is that uh, Dr. Mordecai Johnson was the first black president of Howard University. Well, that's true, but that doesn't tell you anything about uh, what he did as a university builder. And um, he is a very difficult figure to pin down, and I will 
say this. And one of the most important scholarly articles I ever wrote called uh, Through the Back Door, which was published by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And it was about uh, historically black institutions, they're now called, but in those days we called the, the, them Negro colleges. And in it, I wrote about uh, Dr. Ernest Just and what was said about what's supposed to be his tragedy of being at Howard University because of uh, it wasn't it, it, it wasn't fit for him because he was so great, and I made the flat-footed and wrong statement that one of the things that made it unfit and I, these these words which were mine are burned into my consciousness because they're so wrong was that one thing that made Howard University unfit was its dictatorial president for 34 years, Mordecai Johnson. Uh, now, as I say, that was flat wrong. How did I get to be so wrong? Well, I was a great believer in oral history. I interviewed dozens I repeat that, dozens of faculty. And uh, the picture they gave of Mordecai Johnson was of a dictator. Well, it turned out that that was wrong, not only in the multiple cases, but even in the case of Dr. Just, because there was this legend that, that he persecuted Dr. Just. Oh, no such thing. And Dr. Just was honest enough to have made arrangements to preserve his files. And his files were put in the hands of Professor Lewis Hansborough of the zoology department. And he said to Dr. Hansborough, Hansborough, these are precious records. Don't let them out of your hands until you have found someone that you think has sense enough to make good use of them. Well, one of the most flattering things in my career was Professor Hansborough came to me one day and he said, I understand you have been searching for the papers of Professor Just because I may let you be known. How could the papers of this distinguished man who joined the faculty at Howard in 1907 and was world famous as a cytologist and a cancer researcher. What, how could that be? Well, these it turned out, uh, I went down with Professor Hansborough, he used the key, opened this room, and there were the files of Ernest Just. It might have been like opening, as far as I was concerned, opening King Tut's tomb. I had been in pursuit of these files for years because Dr. Just was supposed to be the acid test uh, of the quality of the university. Well, it turned out that the legend was wrong, that yes, there was a disagreement about uh, Dr. Just, but President Johnson was on absolutely solid ground not to agree to the demands Professor Just had made. Professor Just had gone to Europe. Uh, he had been appointed at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Biologie in Berlin, and he had been at uh, a, a comparable institute in Italy, and he was world famous, and he did not want to come back to Howard University. And he was demanding uh, special recognition and uh, a retirement, and he was not retirement age, but he did not want to come back to Washington. Well, he did not want to come back to Washington because of the segregation in Washington. And he thought Howard was too small for him. And Dr. Johnson, of course, could not do that. The trustees could not make a special 
payment arrangement for Dr. Just, so he came back, had to come back. And also, Nazi Germany was on the march, and uh, he was expelled from the labs there because he was black, and the Nuremberg laws would not permit that because they affected not only Jews, but Negroes and gypsies, and you could not work in a German university uh, if you fit in any of those categories. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather because all of the corroborations looked airtight. And so then I started re-examining this question of Mordecai Johnson. And in Dr. Logan's history, a very substantial amount of space is given over to the uh, controversies. And one with Dr. Justice mentioned, with Dean Slow. Well, in the case of the one with Dean Slow, Dean Slow wanted a women's college at Howard University, like Radcliffe at Harvard or Barnard at Columbia. Uh, but that was not consistent with Howard. Howard was founded as a coeducational institution. And Dean Slow, who wanted to be an academic dean, she used to refer to the women's campus, the three dormitories that Mr. Cassell had built and opened in 1931, she called the women's campus. And she wanted a separate women's college because she was a feminist. And Dr. Johnson would not do that. So then the impression was, oh, he's a dictator about that. He was perfectly correct on that. And there was a, a controversy about whether she should live on the campus or not. It's perfectly normal to have the dean of women live on the campus. Uh, so as I looked into these things, I saw that, well, now, the legend is wrong. Let me see what he did. Well, when you look at that, uh, Howard University uh, had been a university from the beginning. It had a national and international reputation long before Mordecai Johnson came. But what he did was the beginning of the modernization of the institution. In its physical form, it had academically begun modernization uh, in the Thurkeel administration because that's when uh, the schools were reorganized. That's when the College of Liberal Arts, it was College of Arts and Sciences then, uh, broke away from the classical curriculum that it had in 1868. So it went from Latin, Greek, and mathematics to the modern social sciences to requiring uh, the natural sciences and the humanities. And the, the presiding genius of that move in the College of Arts and Sciences was uh, Dean Kelly Miller. And, um, but Dr. Johnson's plan for the university was to get every school accredited. When he became president, only two were accredited liberal arts and dentistry. Uh, and to get every school accredited and every school in what he called modern facilities, by which he meant a new building that was consistent with high standards for that kind of program. And he was able to do that. Now, another aspect of his program, which was very controversial in the 1920s, uh, was to create a great Negro university. And many of the alumni said, that is wrong. Howard University has been a great American university from the time it was founded. And we have always had white deans and black deans, white and black faculty. And Mordecai Johnson is trying to change that. Um, 
and give you some sense of that, uh, Dean George W. Cook, for whom Cook Hall is named, and was dean of the Commercial College at one time, and he was the highest ranking Negro at Howard for a long time. He was uh, secretary uh, of the Board of Trustees and was a pillar of Howard University. Uh, he, he was the Charter Day speaker, I think of the years 1923, but um, was definitely in the 20s, and I think it was 23. Uh, Mr. Cook said, we know nothing of Negro education at Howard University. We know about education. Okay? And when Dr. Johnson became president, uh, uh, the dean of engineering was a white man. The dean of medicine was a white man. Uh, and there were other high officials who were white. And Dr. Johnson's view was, we need to collect at Howard University the greatest aggregation of Negro scholars in the world and this ought to be the place where Negro academics are leaders and have opportunities that they don't have at other institutions because they will be central here, not marginal. Now, as it happened, that fit in with much white opinion because they were jumpy about any multiracial institution. And we had a very substantial representation of foreign faculty and students. And there were Americans who were jumping about that. Uh, no, he had, uh, Dr. Johnson had a world view about uh, what he called the Negro peoples of the world which was the language of the left at the time. I'd seldom say the left or the right, but that, that, that was what it was, because the Soviet Union used the term peoples, plural. And uh, that issue, what, what kind of place it was going to be? And he, you know, the first Negro dean of the medical school was appointed in 1929. All, all of those years that the medical school was very proud of being interracial, they had never had a black leader. And so Numa Pompilius Garfield Adams was named dean and was dean from 1929 to 1940 and built that medical school up to a completely different level where it had been. And this was Dr. Johnson's point. He said, nobody will be as ambitious as we will be for ourselves. Uh, and we can prove that it happens, that it's possible. And if we prove it here, then Negroes will have opportunities elsewhere. Because right now, it can be said, well, we can't have a Negro Dean of Engineering or Negro Dean of Medicine, because point one to me, where are we going to get somebody of experience? Well, it turned out it could be done right at Howard University. It also fit in with the program of the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt, because President Roosevelt had a real problem. Uh, there was the so-called Solid South, which was a segregationist South, and the Democratic Party could not win presidential elections without the Solid South. But in the meantime, there was the Great Migration that began in World War I, and black people had gone north into the Midwest and the Far West in search of industrial opportunities and so on. And so there were now substantial black populations in New York, Chicago, Detroit, other cities. And the Democrats needed big city votes in order to win presidential elections. 
So how do you square that? On the one hand, Roosevelt administration is supporting segregationists in the South, <laughs> but they're talking about civil rights in the North. And Roosevelt's answer was, we have a program for Howard University. And that was why President Roosevelt himself dedicated the chemistry building at Howard. So Mr. Cassell's spectacular chemistry building, because at the time it was the most elaborate and best chemistry building in the city, for any university. And so uh, this was going to be uh, the showcase of Negro achievement. And so at Howard University, you will have the largest aggregation of Negro scholars in the world. And so our commencements were followed because people couldn't imagine. Where did all those people come from? Where did those physicists and chemists and medical researchers and engineers and architects, where they could point to Howard. And uh, that was the compromise. His wife became a member of the Howard Board of Trustees. Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt was a significant figure on the board. And so it was an uncomfortable uh, mix because while Dr. Johnson was very clear about pride in what we had accomplished, eagerly looking forward to even greater opportunities. Uh, he was also an integrationist. Again, it is a very fluid mix of things because at the same time that he's talking about the development of a Negro university at Howard University, the law school is busily working to undermine the legal foundations of segregation. And I asked uh, his successor, Dr. Nabert, in a series of interviews I did with him, I said, Dr. Nabert, uh, I have been puzzled as to how a person who became dean and then president of Howard University could argue in the Sweat versus Painter case, which was a segregation case in Texas, that there is nothing that a public authority could do to make uh, a black institution, and in that case it was a black law school, make it equal because what the uh, Texas Southern Law School had been created uh, to keep segregation. They didn't have it before and now they're going to have it, but they're not going to be able to get into the University of Texas and so on. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'll tell you, you don't argue constitutional cases always four square. And then he paused. Sometimes you argue three square. Now the three square part of it was we wanted both things. We wanted uh, uh, the development of our institutions because they weren't created yesterday. And we wanted access to other institutions. And we would be very happy to have other people become part of a modern, multiracial, multicultural, and permeable in terms of international relation, institution. So it wasn't an accident that we had uh, <coughs> at one time the highest percentage of overseas students of any university. Uh, there was always a little contest going on about uh, who had this or that. And now again, as decolonization was underway and we had more and more Indian and 
African and Caribbean students. That was being celebrated because that was the, that was the future of the world. And we had been having overseas students since the 1870s, first Chinese student and so on, as you know. Well, this, everything at Howard is complicated. That was a point of pride that we had educated many of the leaders of the emerging countries. But then members of Congress said, you get federal dollars. These people are not American citizens. Isn't that misuse of federal funds? And some congressmen went after us on that and wanted to have differential tuition because it said you, you, were, not, you were not founded to be part of American foreign relations. So, and there were other Americans, not all of them white, who thought, well, now, these, these opportunities here uh, are just being given away to foreign students. And the answer was no. We are continuing our tradition of being a place of opportunity and development. And we will participate as Dr. Johnson said many times, in the emancipation of humanity. Uh, as you know, he was a Gandhian. Some people were startled that we had so many people at Howard University who were deeply involved in the Indian nationalist movement. Uh, President Johnson himself, uh, Dr. William Stuart Nelson, who was in India during the time of partition, and he and his wife, Dr. Howard Thurman, uh, Dr. Leon Wright, there were many who were more acquainted with those movements than any people you typically found in higher education. And of course, wh when African leaders came here, they could see <coughs> Well, so and so and so and so and so on in, in, in my country was trained at Howard in the School of Architecture. Kwame Nkrumah's chief architect was teaching there. Uh, and so when he taught his students, uh, he could point to projects. The first course in tropical architecture taught in any American university was taught by. Mr. Howard Mackey, who was head of the architecture program, and he was, he was not from a tropical country. He was from the United States. But he could see uh, that tropical architecture is going to be critical for the benefit of people in these emerging economies. Yep. Dr. Winston, we're running okay. out of town, unfortunately. We'll continue in part three of our discussion. Again, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Mm -hmm.